Welcome to the Bearing It All podcast, where we dive deep into the backstories of celebrities, CEOs, and multi-million and billion-dollar entrepreneurs. There are no roles as we aspire to inspire by sharing real experiences, triumphant comebacks, and what the road to success really looks like. It's all about the grit behind the glamour. Well, welcome to the show. We have Sharon Lecter. And her resume is so impressive. It's going to blow you away. And I can't wait to hear and share the backstory. Sharon, welcome to the show. How are you today? Fantastic, Barbara. I'm delighted to be with you. Great. And for anybody who doesn't know Sharon, you... (laughs) You've been asleep for the last several decades. She's a global financial literacy expert, a New York Times bestselling author. She co-wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She's also, when I Googled you, you are a graduate of Florida State University. Is that correct? That's right. Florida State Seminole. I don't know, Sharon, I just found that so, I'm like, what? How did this, what? Okay, I need a full, I, I want to understand that because I know you live out in the desert now. Um, and you've just done so many amazing things. You were appointed to the President's Advisory Council on Financial, li- Financial Literacy to serve two terms. Was that under the same president? One president? No, I served both President Bush and Obama. So equal opportunity. <laughs> Wow. Oh, so both sides of the uh, both sides of the equation. I love it. I love it. I love it. So let's just dive right into it because the reason I launched this podcast is just to hear the backstory. I think that there's so much glamour to everything. It's great to say we've done X, Y, and Z, but we all know that the the climb to achieve these accomplishments is not easy. That's why it's so impressive. And we want to hear really the backstory. And I want to start, what did you study at Florida State University? Why did you go there? How did you end up there? I need a little bit more of the Sharon Lecter that we don't hear about. We can't Google. Um, I can't believe you went to that. that. To me, that's such a like fun party school. So I'm, I'm kind of like envisioning another Sharon Lecter. Please, please <laughs> clear it up for me. <laughs> well, it's definitely a, back then it was considered a party school. I remember uh, Jose Cuervo came in and did a tequila party across the campus. It was quite the thing. Plus, I think the first uh, streaking incident was at Florida State University. So um, I was not part of that, I will tell you. But uh, my degree, my accounting, <laughs> my degree was accounting. I studied accounting at Florida State. Oh wow! Okay, so I do read that you are you're an American accountant. Um, how did you end up there, though? At Florida State. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I grew up in Orlando, so um, I actually was looking at several different universities, but Florida State was um, one that I had visited, and I had done a summer science foundation initiative there in genetics. So I kind of was familiar with the campus and loved it. And so just naturally gravitated to go there for my undergraduate. Mm. But are you from Florida? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Orlando. We moved there when I was eight. And so I went to high school in Orlando and was there. I actually, one of the things that most, most people don't know about me, Barbara, was I was the grand marshal for the grand opening of Disney World in December of 1971. Um, they had the t- <laughs> a high school student from each of the high from each of the high schools in Orlando was the grand marshal for the parade, grand opening parade, and I happened to be one of those. So it was pretty cool. That's very cool. So it sounds like you've always you always have you always been top of your class. I've always uh, yes, I am a recovering straight A student. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, now I'm feeling back the layers here, Sharon. It makes sense. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> so, you, um, where did you go from there? How did you go from accountant to New York Times bestselling author? And it does make sense because you are so well versed in financial literacy. And now that we have become a, become acquainted. I swear to you, I was looking today at like real estate because that's what I do when I want to like decompress. 
And I just, I wanted to do something like very impulsive. And I was like, well, if it doesn't create cash flow, then it's a liability. <laughs> and I'm yes, like, it is. Oh my God, these, these voices are now kind of embedded in my asset, subconscious assets mind. Assets feed you, liabilities eat you. You bet. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I like well, the I quote on was, your. I started my accounting career with one of the big eight public accounting firms way back then, Dinosaur Days. And was doing very, very well. I was um, into my fourth year. Um, I was only the fourth woman ever hired by them. So this was, I was kind of on the forefront of women in business. And one of my clients called me one day and invited me to go with him. He was buying a company out of bankruptcy. And at that time I was working incredibly long hours and not in, I was not in control of my own time. And I thought, well, I still remember going back to my condo with the old yellow legal pad because this was before PCs, before cell phones, and I did pros and cons, and it didn't help me a bit. I could argue both sides, but my hand took off across the top of the page and said, why not? Why not do something different? Why not take a path less traveled? Why not own a piece of the rock? And um, so I made the decision to leave public accounting at that point in time, and I really have never looked back. I've always been an entrepreneur. It happened to be the worst business decision of my life still to this day. But had I not made that decision, because I get to this company and I found all kinds of corruption. And yet at the same, within, within four or five months, I realized I made a colossal mistake and um, kind of went away for a couple of days to figure out what my next move needed to be. Because I'd moved to New Hampshire, did no soul. And when I came back to the office, I had made the decision I needed to you know, find something different. And the company, because it was in bankruptcy, was involved in a bunch of litigation. And they had waited for me to come back for the lawyers from the other side to do their discovery. And I met a young man sitting in my desk, and his name was Michael Lecter. And we were celebrating 42 years of marriage. So the worst business decision gave me the best life decision. And <laughs> Napoleon Hill says, out of every adversity comes a seed of an equal or greater benefit. Well, I got immediate feedback. I got the benefit that's been lifelong. So, Well, congratulations. Four decades of marriage is nothing to poo-poo at. And it sounds like it was a net positive in my in my estimation, and I think you would you would agree that there's never really a failure. It's more of a lessons learned. I'm sure you took a lot out of not because you, you also have to learn what not to do, right? I mean, you got full you got front row of like what a crime scene, right? Because I think some people think everything has to be perfect and you can't make mistakes, and but I think that really making those decisions help you align with what really who you are and where you want to go. Would you agree? Yes, as you I, I, you put it precisely as I do. There are no mistakes. There are learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest gifts I had being in public accounting for four years was I was on the inside of lots of companies that were successful and lots of companies that were making mistakes. So I had such an education during that time. Plus having grown up in a very entrepreneurial home, I had the benefit of learning things that they don't teach in school. You know, my parents, mm -hmm. had, I lived in a little tiny house between my mom's beauty shop and my dad's used car lot. And I was embarrassed mm. with where we lived. We owned rental properties that at 10 years old, I was going in to scrub out bathrooms between tenants. And I, I was embarrassed by it, but what an education that I understood later in life that I received because it was all about buying, building and creating assets. And that word is my favorite word on earth, assets. And that's what creates financial independence, income producing assets. And that education of how I was raised and being in public accounting allowed me to start teaching others and opening their eyes to the world of cash flow, the word you just use, cash flow. And um, it's been my mission to elevate the financial well-being of human humanity, and sometimes it's one person at a time. 
I, I well, I love when you talk about it, and because I too believe that it's like a missing sector in our upbringing. I never heard cash flow. I never. I mean, I, if I heard it, it was probably off the news. I never heard about assets versus liabilities. I'm f in my late forties and really starting to understand how to make more decisions. Like, does it produce revenue? Is it appreciating? And like all these words and this language that is, uh, you know. Um, I just so empowering because you can make better decisions when you know better, you can do better. What I mean, what do you feel about our education? Like how we're educating this next generation in regards to money, finances, uh, literacy, <laughs> financial literacy? Well, schools still not come very far along the idea of mm -hmm. teaching financial education. School teaches us to exchange time for money, work for mm -hmm. money. And the problem is there's only so many hours in the day and only so many days in the week. And so, you know, my superpower is I help people understand, invest your time in mind building, creating those assets and those assets become your employees. They're working for you 24 seven. But unfortunately, school is still focused on teaching us to be employees, which means we're not in control. It's our employer or government in charge. And so you have to take charge. It's not what you do for your paycheck that determines your success. It's what you do with your paycheck. There's nothing wrong with being an employee, but how are you reinvesting those dollars? Are you taking the money you're earning by exchanging time for money and redeploying them and investing them in other assets that generate income? See, I find this so now it all adds up and it makes sense. And I'm like, it's a new way for me to think and you know, think naturally. It naturally starts to to make sense. So let's go back. You meet your husband and not it's not your dream job, but you'll learn a little bit. But you're up in New Hampshire. There's a lot of miles for me to cover here because I'm very curious. You didn't <laughs> stay in New Hampshire, but like what what happened here? No, I was only there for less than nine months and I moved back to DC, which is where Michael lived. And we were married in 1980 and we mm -hmm. were in DC um, for four years before we moved out to Wisconsin. And that's when I met the young man. Um, he'd love me to think he was older, but he created the Talking <laughs> Children's book, the very first Talking Children's book that had the sound strips down the side. And so I teach people that successful businesses solve problems or serve needs. And my kids mm -hmm. at that point in time didn't like to read and their friends didn't like to read. And he had this technology. And remember, I'm talking dinosaur days, 87, 1987, when... <laughs> There were no <laughs> Tyrannosaurus <electronics>. Rex. <laughs> yes, there were no electronics. Kids did not have screens attached to them all day long. So this <laughs> talking children's book was the first time there'd been any technology. And so I said, you know, for us to get parents to trust us, we're a brand new company. We need to align with a brand they trust. So we did deals with Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, Marvel Comics, and allowed us to explode around the world. Our first year, we thought we were hot stuff, million dollars in revenue. Then we went to nine million, then 23 million. And then on the way to 52 million, we sold the company. And that, that taught me so much about solving problems and serving needs, but also understanding licensing, understanding the power of association, which is what I teach. We don't mm -hmm. have to do things by ourselves create something and then find other people that can help you leverage it through other people's money, time and resources. Wow, I didn't know this. I didn't know this about the 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 talking book. That's incredible. Then where do you go from here? So now you've sold this company, you got a few shekels in the bank to say the mm -hmm. least, right? What what happens next? Are you still in Wisconsin? I mean, you you try well, you move was, around. Yeah, we sold the company and then we moved here to Arizona. And this was 1991, same year we sold the company. My husband is a, was a partner in a large um, intellectual property firm, and he was spirited away by another firm, and we moved to Arizona. And that's really where I started other entrepreneurial endeavors, another talking children's book that was not quite so successful. And then um, that was December of 1992 when our oldest son had gone to college in September, 
came home, got to school, and they had these tables, free pizza, free money, free t-shirt, free money. And he came home at Christmas time in credit card debt. We didn't even know he had mm-hmm. credit cards. We were so I was so upset with him, but more upset with myself. And we, we refused to bail him out. It took him seven years to get out of debt and to repair his credit. But that was really December of 1992 was the pivotal point in my career. I dedicated the rest of my career to financial literacy, financial education, and supporting entrepreneurs and creating successful businesses. And I'm still as passionate about it today as I was back then. Wow, seven years, your your son, how many credit cards did he open? What happened? Well, he had a really good time his first semester, yeah. He had a girlfriend <laughs> that had moved to a different city. And so he was right. you know, using these credit cards. Yes, it was an interesting time. But uh, he had to move back home. He had to get a job, that kind of thing. So he's as passionate good lessons, today. Though. Yeah. No, yeah, good I'm very lessons. Proud of yep. Yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, and it, it helped you to see, again, you just said, solving problems and serving needs. You know, it, it's one thing to just sit there and mire in something. So you were probably so frustrated as a parent, as a human being watching probably wasn't only, not only your son doing this, but all of his contemporaries right. just running their credit into the ground. But there you go, practicing what you're what you're preaching. So I, I I'm impressed. Now the Rich Dad Poor Dad series is that was an impressive um an impressive run. Where how did that get off the ground? Well, this you know, as I said, 1992 was when I dedicated my career to financial literacy, and I started mm-hmm. working with school systems. My hair actually used to be red; it's white. If you ever work with school systems, it can be very frustrating. <laughs> But fast forward a few years, 1996, I get a call one day, and back then cell phones were like this big and attached to Mm -hmm. the car. And so I had one. I'm like embarrassed. I'm leaning down, hello. And it was my husband, and he says, Sharon, I met a guy today that has what you've been looking for. So I always joke about this when I'm speaking, particularly to women. You know, what would you do if your husband called you and said, I met a guy that has what you've been looking for. <laughs> I, still, I still remember where I was where it was on the street. And I'm going, okay, honey, this sounds a little kinky. Tell me more. And um, he had Keep this talking. guy come in. Yeah, he had this guy in his come into his office in flip-flops and board shorts, Hawaiian shirt with this idea for a board game rolled up on a piece of paper under his arm, and he came to see Michael about getting it protected through a patent and copyright trademarks. And it was exactly the same thing I was teaching. And so I met Robert Kiyosaki at a beta, the initial beta test of the board game Cash Flow. And I loved it. I was the only one that got out of the rat race at this beta test. But I volunteered based on my work with the talking book. I had the distribution systems, the manufacturing systems, and the technology to support him getting that game done. And so I volunteered to help him. And during that process, he told me he wanted to charge $200 for the game. And this is 1996. And I said, well, you know, Robert, you may want to write a brochure that explains your philosophy that would convince people to invest $200 in a board game. And that's when he asked me to become his partner. And that brochure that we wrote was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. This was the original copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad that we released in April 8th of 1997, so over 25 years ago. And that Mm -hmm. started a 10 year relationship, a 10 year partnership. We wrote 15 books together, five of which made it to the New York Times bestseller list. And we exploded around the world, um, over 110 countries, over 51 languages. And um, it was the right message at the right time took the world by storm. We built the largest personal finance brand in the world. And that was my ability to, as CEO, I was CEO of the company. Mm -hmm. And it was um, such an incredible experience. People read the book, loved it, wanted to share it with other people. It was a great story. I mean, I remember reading, I graduated college in 1997. And that was one of the first books that really started to move the needle for me and understanding the power of mindset and being an apprentice. I remember how it all started. And I mean, I 
it was 25 years ago that I read the book, but I do remember is very strong. And now that I've heard your backstory about your parents, was some of the storyline pulled from your own personal experience? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was. We, you know, we wrote 15 books together. The initial Rich Dad, Poor Dad is largely based on Robert's uh, story of having a father who was a superintendent of education and a, mm -hmm. his best friend's father who became one of the wealthiest men in Hawaii. And it talks about- Was that the, a legit, that was a legit story? Yes, it was. And it, most oh, of it. And that okay. was you know, the lessons that he learned. But I interject information that I learned along the way from my father. And that, you know, it really allowed us to give a depth of understanding by showing different examples. I think it's, I, I think it was genius. It was definitely genius. And I think it actually has um, just as much relevance now in conversations. So I love that. Um, I love that you did that. And did you ever sell the game? Did the game oh, yeah. take off? The game, yeah, the game, the game went around the world as well, multiple languages. And was yeah. it, was it $200? Yes, it's not anymore, oh. but initially it was 200, absolutely. I'm gonna say this, so my dad brought home some video game once and I must have been in, I guess sixth grade, somewhere around there. And now I'm a twin, so I have a twin brother and then I have younger twin brothers that are three years younger. And my brothers and I were obsessed with this game, but Sharon, it was such a smart video game because it was about, um, it was all about buying like real estate and bridges and tunnels. And my brother was always just a little bit better than me, my twin brother, because I would build the bridges. And while he's, I'm building the bridges and spending my money to build the bridges so we can get to the islands, he's building these condominiums. <laughs> and I'm like building the yeah, infrastructure and he's built <laughs> And I, he would just- Real estate, yep. And slowly as I got better, as like, I would build the bridge. <laughs> just enough until there was like a one dangling like it somebody had to put the piece in because i was like why are you like I, I it took me a little while my brother was always like two steps ahead of me but i will the reason i bring that up is because gamifying concepts in financial literacy is just as relevant now like that's a, it's such a really great idea and i'm so grateful my dad did that because i do remember the win and creating opportunities where all of a sudden your bank you, you had so much money you only had so much money. Anyway, I just think there's a lot of value to gamifying concepts for not only children, but also adults. I think adults like gamifying. <laughs> what do you think? Well, that was the beauty of cash flow because what happens if parents bought it to play with their kids and then playing with them allowed them to learn it too. And mm -hmm. the thing about it, and I've since created a, a game um, in my new company called Thrive Time for Teens, which is more specific for that age 12 to 20 um, to give them more realistic expectations. But the thing is when, when parents play with the kids, it creates a safe space, safe environment. It doesn't become so personal. Many times parents hesitate to teach their kids about money because they don't want them to know that they themselves are struggling. And I, I wanted to mm -hmm. create something that gave them a tool to talk about these subjects because financial education is the gift of a lifetime. Once mm -hmm. you understand money, you understand how to make money, you can do it repeatedly. The problem is getting mm -hmm. that fundamental education into the hands of our young people as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, I... Um... I want to ask you what kind of adv what advice would you give to this next generation in regards to learning about money? Because I do think um, people that have our best interest don't always know what is best, and I don't think that's messaged enough. What advice? Like, what is there books? Just tell me, what kind of advice would you give to this next generation who is just starting out, probably in debt because they put themselves through college? What can they do to start building um, their little nest egg? Well, it is, it's hard to teach something you don't know. And it's hard, you know, and, and so that a lot of parents hesitate because they themselves are struggling mm -hmm. financially. And so that's why you need to reach out. And that's what I, why I do what I do. I do a lot of speaking, mm -hmm. a lot of, I have a lot of programs that are very inexpensive to teach people about money mastery. I have programs for teenagers 
And, you know, this is not a promotional message, but there are, there are others out there. So the information is there if you seek it. Um, the, at the end of the day, you need a lot of people want to invest in how to get to a million followers or how to, how to you know, be a better salesperson. The problem is you have to understand how to use that money and how to deal with the money mm-hmm. when you get it. Not just to earn it, but how do you invest it and make it multiply and provide financial stability for you? And, and sometimes that's the part that people are afraid to do. They, they put their head in the sand. And I go, until you understand not just how to make it, but how to keep it and how to work it for you so that it multiplies, Mm -hmm. you're never going to get to the level of financial security that you deserve to be. I agree. And I think just even in the concept of like, it's something that has to be learned and you did not learn it in a classroom. And it's a high probability that your parents don't know either. They may be, they may have figured out like how to save money, but if you're looking to build generational wealth, you want to live a certain lifestyle, you have to learn that. And I don't, I don't know that that's taught so much. Like did the understanding of like, don't be, you know, don't be embarrassed or intimidated that you don't know these things. You no, Nobody taught you. You have to actually pursue that information as if you were pursuing another degree, an advanced, you know, you know an advanced degree. I, that's what I wish somebody would have said to me, like understanding how to create generational wealth and live a, a, a lifestyle, the freedom that you want takes, you, you, you do, you have to submerse yourself in education and you have to be able to listen and listen to new things. You know, I think I was, I was raised even, you know, with this mindset, um, get a good job, save your money, save your money, save your money. Now I'm understanding it's not just, it's have your money work for you, build assets, have cash flow, make money in your sleep. When somebody said that to me, uh, this is some 20 something years ago, because I've always been fascinated on how to make money and, and how to live a good lifestyle and how to take care of, you know, I have brother with special needs and just really getting to that understanding of like, how, how do you do that? And that somebody said, you have to learn how to make money in your sleep. And I was like, oh, so that, that happens. people do that. <laughs> So how does that happen? And that's what you're talking about. So many people trade time for money when when you get can get educated. So I love, I love, I love all of this. What do you have going on right now? Like what are where do people find you? Do, what books? Like what's going on? Tell me everything. <laughs> well, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I'm really easy to find. I'm Sharon Lecture everywhere. Instagram, Facebook, my LinkedIn, Sharon Lecture, my um author Sharon Lecter is the tag for my Facebook page, but you also can come to SharonLecter.com. You can reach out to me directly by emailing me info at SharonLecter.com. We have a myriad of programs from very inexpensive um, money mastery programs all the way up to high level mentoring that I choose that I work one-on-one with individuals to help them get to the next level whether it be personally, financially, or in their business, getting their business to the next level. Um, Being a mentor is something that I love to do. Uh, I love to see other people succeed and and support them in reaching that next level. And you also help people write books. You do writer's retreats. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Well, having written 27 books, I have a little experience (laughs) in not just writing them, but getting them published and marketing them. A lot of people write books and yet they don't understand how to build the platform, the business around the book. And so I teach the holistic approach, not just writing it and getting it done, but how do you publish it and how do you promote it so that you can reach the greatest number of people? You know, I have a, a Facebook group that I started a few years ago called the Play Big Movement because too many people play small. I want people to play a bigger game. And the Play Big Movement is about being number one in your field, live your legacy because your legacy is created every single day with every heart you touch and to create maximum impact. So if you're gonna do something, you mm-hmm. owe it to do it as big as possible, reach as many people as possible. And that's through understanding, having the right mentor, having the right systems, playing a bigger game, having the right associations that help take your message and spread it around the world. Wow, that's unbelievable. I mean, I just have been sitting here taking notes on how to have maximum impact 
and um, not, oh my God, live your legacy. I absolutely love that. Um, so what's in store for you for this live your legacy? I mean, you're, are you ever stopping? <laughs> you, I, I just saw that, that you traveled. I'm starting to get it complex, Barbara, because I get asked that question <laughs> a lot. Um, I'm 68, so yes, I'm up there. And obviously uh, my husband is 73. So people ask us about that all the time, but. I love what I do, so I don't consider mm -hmm. it work. It's not work. And it's something that feeds me. You know, I just mm -hmm. literally was on the call with a client this morning and you know, she started a new business and within six months, she's already in six figures. And you know, that gives me such joy to see people moving in that direction. And that's what I wanna support people in doing that because that feeds me. Um, my team mm -hmm. did a like a mock-up magazine cover for me uh, saying my legacy was a legacy of creating legacies and i love that because that it's not about me it's about supporting you and supporting others to create and position themselves in the best position of, of potential <laughs> that is really good a legacy of supporting legacies and you know the reason i ask that because i know you're never going to stop i find it so inspiring to see that, you know, um, you know, in yoga, we talk about being on like, I'm on the fourth floor, you're on the sixth floor, your husband's on the seventh floor. And I do yoga with women in their on, on the seventh floor, they're in their 70s. And they are so smoking hot. And it just gives I'm like, I have so much road ahead of me, and so much to accomplish and so many, so many things that I can can do and i think just we more people need to see it i think the old narrative of the golden girls which by the way they were on the fifth floor when they were in their retirement homes so you know it's um we we need more of you we need more of the women i do yoga with because it just says like life is rich at every floor and it's in, in, and it's so powerful and I absolutely love it. So your legacy about creating more legacies, I absolutely love it. Just one more time, Sharon, will you let us know where everyone can find you? Cause I know they're gonna wanna hunt you down and um, spell it out for them. Well, thank you. Please reach out to me, info at SharonLector.com. Come to the website, there's a way to contact me there if you want information about my programs or if you want, are interested in the one-on-one -on -one mentoring that I do, please reach out to us. It's through the website, SharonLector.com or just give us a, a, a shout out through email, info at SharonLector.com. I absolutely love it. I can't wait to see what you're gonna do on the seventh floor. Or so an eighth floor and ninth, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks I'm again, ready. Sharon. Why, why not? <laughs> Why not? You said yeah. it in your 20s, right? You got to yep. keep saying it. Why not? Just leave it all out in the field. I, I'm so grateful for this. Um, I absolutely love talking with you. I have a million and six more questions, but it'll allow me to invite you back on my third season. So uh, thank you for being part of this relaunch. I appreciate you. And um, I will see you soon. I'm hoping to come out to Arizona, a little one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. I can't wait to <laughs> Thanks, see you. Sharon. I love working with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Bearing It All podcast, where we explore what it means to live your best life. To stay connected, go to barbaramajeski.com and leave us your email. We'll keep you posted on all that it means to have the health, wealth, and happiness that you deserve.